We apologise for the poor quality of this recording. Although digitally restored, the sound quality is not to the standard we would like. However, we hope that it doesn't spoil your enjoyment of this message by Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones. I should like to call your attention this evening to the message of those great verses that were read to us just now by Dr Fitch in the 107th Psalm, the first 30 verses of the 107th Psalm. And I'm going to read again the first three verses. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Now, though I read these three verses, I propose, as I say, to consider with you the message of this whole section. Indeed, I should have said 31 verses, beginning with all oh, that men, ending with all oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now, some of you may be surprised that I should propose to deal with the 31 verses. Let me tell you why I'm doing so. We must never forget that a psalm is, after all, a song. And it seems to me very often to be as pointless to deal with only one verse in a psalm as it would be to repeat that one note in a song. A song is a whole. And a psalm, in the same way, is a whole. And the psalmist, in his psalm, is anxious always to convey some one complete whole message. Now, if that is true of every psalm, I feel that it is particularly true of this one hundred and cent psalm. Because, though it is a long psalm going on eventually to forty-three verses, there is a unity about it. There is one great message, and the man, of course, announces it in these early verses. He starts by saying, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That's what he's concerned about. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That's what he wants to do, to sing this great hymn of praise unto God. And the method that he adopts is this. He seems to be gathering together a great choir to sing the praises of God. He's gathered them out of the lands. He's called them to come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Wherever you are, he says, whatever point of the compass you may dwell in, come together. He invites men and women from all quarters of the globe, from all parts of the earth, to come together in order that he may conduct them in the singing of this great anthem of praise and of thanksgiving unto the Lord, who is so good, whose mercy endureth forever. But now I want to try to show you that this man, in putting it like that and in doing that, deals with a very modern problem. The Bible, of course, is an ageless book. It is because it is the word of God. And its message is always appropriate to all times and to all places. And all the passing of the years and the centuries makes no difference whatsoever to what it's got to tell us. And here, it seems to me, the psalmist deals with a very modern problem indeed. It is the whole question as to why so many people at the present time in our world, are refusing and rejecting this glorious gospel of the blessed God. They adduce many reasons for doing this. But I think you'll agree that one of the favorite reasons that they bring forward is in some such terms as this. They say that uh, whether a man is religious or not is something that is more or less entirely dependent upon his makeup upon his temperament, if you like, upon his psychology. 
They're very ready to say about those of us who are religious, yes, that's all right. You happen to be like that. You were born like that. They have no objection to our doing this if we want to go on doing so. But they say, I'm not like that. It doesn't interest me. It's got nothing to say to me. And what they object to is that we should come to them and try to persuade them to believe this, to accept it and to live by it. They say, you're quite wrong. You mustn't force this upon everybody. Now, they say you must recognize that we're all different and that we're born with different makeups and different temperaments and different psychologies. One man is born a poet. Another man is born with a, a musical gift. Another man has a dramatic gift. Another has a scientific gift. Well, they say you've got to recognize that. You wouldn't dream of trying to force or foist poetry upon a man who's a scientist or vice versa. You recognize that we are different in this way. So they say, what right have you got to ask all of us to listen to your gospel and to believe it and to accept it? You're doing violence to what is obviously a very veritable law of nature. Why not recognize that there are people who have what they like to call the religious complex? Born like that, the religious mentality, the religious outlook. Why not recognize that and allow people who are born like that to go on, but don't try to force others and try to say that this is something universal and that is applicable to the whole of mankind. Now, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with this attitude that is taken by so many at the present time, this reason that they give for their refusal and their rejection of the gospel. Now here, this man, you see, before psychology was ever even thought of, this man is well aware of all that, and he deals with it, and he gives what I'm hoping to be able to show you is the final answer to all such specious argumentation and reasoning. He shows how groundless, how useless it is, and how completely false. Now, not only do we find that in this song, this is a message which one finds everywhere throughout the entire Bible. Let me give you but one obvious uh, example of this, which in itself should be quite sufficient to put an end to all this attempt to explain away the unbelief of so many at the present time. Look at the apostles, the twelve apostles. What a remarkable collection of men you have there. How they differed from one another. A Peter, typical impulsive, bold, mercurial type of person. John, on the other hand, obviously, somewhat philosophical in his outlook, great apostle of love in spite of his being, in a sense, at the same time, a violent man in the depths. But the two men were obviously very different men, and when you think of the great apostle Paul, you find yet another entirely different man. Yet all of them are together as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you read through these various accounts. You find a woman like Lydia becoming a Christian. You find a violent man like the Philippian jailer in the same chapter also becoming a Christian, joining the Christian church and, in, and proceeding in the same Christian life. So you see, the New Testament and the Bible are full of this kind of thing. And as you follow the long history of the Christian church throughout the centuries, you get exactly the same series of facts. Within the Christian church, at all times and in all ages and places, you will find every conceivable type or combination or permutation of character, psychology, call it what you like, in the Christian church. You get your phlegmatic Englishman. You get your mercurial Welshman, if you like, or Scott. But they're both in the same church. You can go throughout the world and look at the various races. It doesn't matter what the color is. It doesn't matter what the climb of the continent. It doesn't matter what their background, what their antecedents, what their social circumstances may have been. In the Christian church, today as throughout the centuries, you have represented every possible conceivable type of individuality and of personality. And all of them are together 
worshipping the same triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now this is just a great fact of history, as it is a fact of the present time. And surely the fact alone should be sufficient to give the lie direct to this specious argument which tries to evade the challenge, the demands of the gospel in terms of psychology or of temperament. But I want to show you tonight how this man, in a very much more beautiful and better way than that, puts this great case that I've been trying to put to you feebly in my modern language and terminology. Now, he does it like this. You must have noticed it as Dr. Fitch read these verses at the beginning. What this man does is to confront us by four types of persons. He's got four pictures which he paints, or if you prefer it, he is calling together four great main types of personality to join together in this great hymn of praise and of thanksgiving unto God. How is he going to do so? As I say, he calls them from the east and from the west. But you say that's impossible. There's an iron curtain between east and west. But he also calls them from the north and from the south. But you say, traditionally, the people in the north never get on very well with people in the south. They're generally entirely different. And history shows that some of the great quarrels and civil wars of history have always taken place in divisions between north and south. How are you ever going to do this? Is it possible? Of course it is, says this man. Because, in spite of the apparent and superficial differences in these four types, Fundamentally, they are precisely one and exactly the same. Now, here is something that the modern man is obviously missing completely. He only looks at the surface. He sees different color. He sees different culture. Ah, oh, he says that they're entirely different. You'll never get them to come to the same place. That's simply because they look at things superficially. The moment you examine these people in the depth, you find that they're one. As the poet has put it, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. But let's follow this man. He's got here, I say, his four wonderful pictures. I'm going to hold them before you. That's all I've got to do, is just to hold his pictures before you. And of course, as I say, at first, as you look at them, you will tend to say, well, there's nothing in common at all between these people. Let's look then at the first picture which he starts describing in the fourth verse. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. What have we got here? Well, here is a picture, you see, of a number of men in a wilderness, traveling in a wilderness. They are looking, as he says, for a city of habitation in which they can dwell. They've set out, hopefully, in the morning to arrive at this city. But on and on they've gone, and they haven't found it. They've lost their way many times, but they've come back to some track, and they've been hopeful and optimistic, only to be disappointed again. Ever and again they meet a man, and he asks them, where are you going? They say, we want to go to that city of habitation. He says, follow me, I'll bring you to the city of habitation. And they follow him, but he doesn't bring them there. Another comes, offers his services, speaks with great assurance. They follow him. Still, there is no sight of the city. And at long last, a mist comes on, and nightfall is drawing on. But they haven't arrived at the city. There they are, still in the wilderness, groping about, trying to find the city of habitation, but failing completely. What's this? Well, I think that this is a very wonderful picture of uh, the great quest of the modern men for truth, for reality as they call it. We're all philosophers today, and we're all seekers and searchers after the truth. And we set out, particularly in our youth, full of confidence and assurance and optimism, we are very sorry for all who lived before us. They were so ignorant. They hadn't split the atom. They hadn't our wonderful knowledge. 
They haven't garnered all this information that we've inherited. But we are the people. We are 20th century. We've come of age. We've grown up. And we are the people who are going to arrive at a knowledge of truth. And out we go, full of excitement, interest, confidence, and enthusiasm. But after a while, we begin to realize that we're not arriving anywhere. And now, a man confronts us, a great philosopher, a great scientist, perhaps. He says, all right, I'll take you to the city. I'll bring you to a knowledge of truth. And we go after him, read all his books, listen to all his lectures, attend his seminars. This is the man, the man. But after a while, we become a little disappointed. Another man comes. You've noticed the fashions, haven't you, in the books and the writers? The people who have their vogue, they're all the rage, and everybody's reading them. Then they're dropped, and you hear no more about them. Another comes up, and we again are equally enthusiastic. And thus we listen to our proffered guides and are ready to follow them and believing that they can lead us to this ultimate knowledge of truth. We're exactly like these people depicted by the psalmist in the wilderness. And on and on we go. We get to middle age. We begin to get old. And the night begins to draw on. Our powers and faculties begin to wane. But after a lifetime of study and reasoning and research, we haven't arrived at the city of truth, at the city of habitation. And we find ourselves exhausted, disappointed, and disillusioned. Now there is his first picture. A picture of people seeking for this city of truth, this city of habitation. Well now, let's look at the second. And immediately you feel you're looking at something which is entirely different. Tenth verse. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder, all oh, that men would praise the Lord. For he had broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. I think you'll agree. It's an entirely different picture. The first people were in a wilderness. Their trouble, in a sense, was they had too much room. But here, we are no longer in a wilderness. We are in a prison. And we are looking at a poor man in a prison cell. There he is, chained in the corner of his cell. Gates of brass, iron gates. A helpless, hopeless prisoner. He can't get out. Confined in a cell absolutely in a condition of slavery and of serfdom. Well, as I say, on the surface, it seems to be entirely and completely different. What are we dealing with here? Well, surely this is just a perfect picture and portrayal of the slavery of sin and of evil habits and practices. Here are men and women who are bound in fetters and chains of iron, hemmed in by gates of brass, absolutely in a condition of slavery and completely helpless, slaves to their lusts and their passions and their evil natures. And they do their utmost to break through and to break free, but they can't, you can't do anything about these bars of iron and these gates of brass. My dear friends, I mustn't keep you with these pictures, but isn't this a terribly true picture? of so many in this modern world of ours, the people who played originally very hopefully and very confidently with drink or with drugs, saying, of course, no man should ever be a drunkard, no man should ever become a drug addict. But after all, you mustn't be Victorian in your ideas. You must be a modern man and you must experiment and you must try everything in life. You mustn't live a kind of shackled life. And so quite confidently and hopefully they were never going to be victims. They were just going to have a good time and to enjoy themselves. But there they are, in the corner of the cell, bound in fetters and chains, slaves and unable to set themselves free. I'm not saying all this in order to condemn these people. I'm saying it in order that our hearts may be moved by these people. The tragedy of these people, young people, by the hundreds in all our cities and countries at the present time, here is their very condition, slaves to these desires and passions and lusts. 
There's our second picture. But let's go on to the third picture. And this again seems to be quite different. Verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth, saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men should praise the Lord, etc. Well, you see, the scene has changed. We are no longer in a wilderness. We are no longer in a prison cell. Where are we now? Well, we're in a very ordinary house and in a very ordinary bedroom. And we're looking at someone who's lying on a bed, weak, exhausted, apathetic and uninterested in life. Somebody brings in a tray of food, carefully prepared, deliciously prepared as possible. They don't want to see it. Their souls abhor all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Nothing that their loved ones or anybody else can do for them helps them at all. They just want to be left alone. They've lost grip of life. They've lost the power of living. And there they are just languishing. What is this? Surely it doesn't need much imagination to understand this picture. Oh, there are thousands of such people in this world of ours tonight. They've just got nothing to live for. They're just exhausted. There may be many reasons for this. It may be the treachery of some trusted friend. It may be some disappointment. Someone whom they loved had let them down. Uh, it doesn't matter what the reason is. There are so many people who don't feel that life is worth living. They don't want to go on. Life has become empty. It's been evacuated of all that made it worth living. They're just languishing. They're just existing. There's nothing in it, they say. And all that you try to do for them, you can't help them. They've lost their whole interest in life. And there they are, merely existing. Oh, there are thousands of people like this, I say. They may, some of them, look very respectable upon the surface. But they've lost everything vital. This happens to many people in their married life, and in their home life, and in many other respects. The glamour, the glory is gone. And they're just going on, existing. Not living but existing from day to day. Let me hurry to the last picture, because this again is an entirely different scene. They that go down to the sea in ships, verse 23, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commendeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wits' ends. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. What's this? Well, you see, we are now no longer in a wilderness, in a prison, or in a room. We're on the high seas, and a mighty storm is risen. The gale is howling and the billows are rolling. And the little ship is being tossed hither and thither. And here are these people on board, staggering like drunken men at their wit's ends, not knowing what to do. Up and down. The last moment seems to be coming. What is this? Well, once more. Isn't this far too true a picture and portrayal of the lives of so many people at this present time? What are they? They're but victims of circumstance and chance. They're not in control of their lives. They're like this little ship in the teeth of the storm. The man's life doesn't uh, depend upon his decisions. Oh, I could illustrate this to you almost endlessly. There are men in this world today, there's something good about them fundamentally, but you know, when they leave their homes in the morning, they have no idea what they'll be like when they return that night. It all depends upon whom they may meet. If they meet a certain man, all will be well. If they meet another man, all will be very wrong. They don't know what they're going to be like. Their wives and children don't know what they're going to be like. Why not? Well, because they've lost control. They're like a little ship in the midst of this storm. There's no one can guide it. They're helpless. They've abandoned everything, as it were, and they're there at the mercy of the billows and the wind, like a little ship tossed about hither and thither. You know what I mean, my friends, don't you? What a picture this is 
of so many people. Yes, intelligent people very often. But they're such, you see, that they are utterly the victims of circumstance, chance, chance meeting, accidental meeting. And so their whole lives has got out of control. And if they're in the midst of a storm and they don't know what's going to happen next, everything seems to be a wreckage in all directions. There is your fourth picture. What a comprehensive picture these four make together of the life of the modern men, the men who rejects the gospel, but there it is. Well, now, as I say so far, the impression I must have left upon you is that these people are all different. How can these men ever get all these different types to join together in the same anthem, in the same great song of praise and of thanksgiving? Well, you've already seen it, haven't you? Though they are so different on the surface, you've noticed that there is one thing that is said about all of them. They cried unto the Lord in their distresses. They're all in distress. The cause of the distress is not the same in the four cases. Indeed, there are four different causes, but every one of them is in distress. Every one of them is in trouble. Every one of them is in desperate need. Every one of them is completely helpless. Your first people have been seeking and searching after truth, following their guides. They haven't arrived, and they don't know what to do. And night is coming on, and the mist is gathering, and they feel there's nothing to do but to lie down and to trust that something better will happen. Completely helpless, absolutely helpless. Secondly, the people in the cell, exactly the same. They can't do anything. They'll never get out. They can't break these iron fetters and baits of brass. They're absolutely helpless and helpless. So is this other person on the sick bed. So are those people in the teeth of the storm on the mighty ocean. What am I trying to say? I'm simply saying this, that this is something which is common to all Christian people. What is a Christian? A Christian is a man who realizes that he's not only helpless, but that he's hopeless. A man who thinks that he can order his life and save himself is a denier of the Christian message. Any man who has any self-confidence, any hopefulness concerning himself is remote from Christianity. A Christian is a man who has realized that he's a sinner, that he's lost, that he is completely helpless. He's made his New Year resolutions. He's made his promises. He's taken his decisions, but he can't keep them. He's absolutely helpless and without any hope whatsoever. He's tried everything. He's come to the end. He says in the great words of Augustus Top Lady, not the labors of my hands, can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. He's a man who's in distress. He's in trouble. My dear friends, let's be clear about this. I feel there's a lot of confusion about it at the present time. People are asked to receive Christ and so on. And you ask them, well, uh, did you undergo a very prolonged conviction of sin? They don't know what you're talking about. You say to them, did you repent? They don't know what repentance means. They've been told that that's something that may happen later. But this is a denial of the whole of the teaching of the Bible from beginning to end. The Christian is a man who has seen himself to be an utter absolute failure. I mean, in the matter of truth, in the matter of conquering temptation and lust and passion. I mean, in being a master of life. I mean, in being control of your very existence and enjoying it to the full. The Christian is a man who has come to this realization that as he is, and all his efforts, and all the efforts of the world with him, avail him nothing whatsoever. They've been in a common experience of distress, of trouble, of anguish, not knowing what to do. You see, though they were different, they all share this common experience of desperate, terrible need. Now, the New Testament has its own way of putting that. Listen to Paul putting it to the Ephesians. Here were he quickened. 
who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation. You notice, we all had our conversation. Paul himself, in times past, living according to the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were all together the children of wrath even as others. The whole world lieth guilty before God. There is none righteous. No, not one. Now, it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter whether you've been brought up in a religious home or whether you've entered a place of worship for the first time in your life tonight. It makes no difference at all. There is a common denominator to the whole of humanity. It is this sin, failure, helplessness, hopelessness, in distress with the law of God thundering at us and the thought of, fa of facing their holy and eternal God. Common experience of need, common experience of distress. It is true of the whole of mankind this evening. Whatever color, continent, clime, civilization you may have come out of, it is universal truth, universally true of the entire human race. We are all dead. We have died in Adam. We are the children of Adam. We are the children of wrath, even as others. But thank God it doesn't stop at that. They go on to share another thing in common. What is that? Well, you've noticed it, haven't you? It said about the four types. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. In the common experience of need and distress, they cried out unto the same Lord, for there is only one. There is none other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. Let me say it again. This is an exclusive and intolerant gospel. There is only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All these people, in their utter helplessness, they've tried the philosophers. They've tried the religions of the world. They've tried the various teachings. But not one of them has succeeded. They're all in trouble. They're all still in distress. Some have tried pleasure. Some have tried immersing themselves in business. Some have tried this and that. It doesn't matter. They're all in trouble and they're all in distress. And the night is coming or death is drawing near or the next bill is going to smash the ship. And in their distress they suddenly remembered him or they were suddenly told about him and they cried out to him in their distress pleading with him to save them. Let me complete that verse of Augustus top lady. Not the labors of my hand can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite now? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. In their utter helplessness, they came to him saying, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. Or like the poor publican depicted in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, they just cry out and say, Lord, be propitious toward me, have mercy upon me. They cry out unto this one and only blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, beseeching him to have mercy and to save him that they share in common the same law. And that leads me, obviously, to the last point, which is this. Having cried out unto the same Lord, they now experience the same deliverance, the same salvation. They read, take the first group. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. That's verse 6, verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19. 
Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. And then you've got it in verse 28. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. My dear friends, this is the most glorious thing of all. They share the great common salvation. Of course, they may experience it in different ways. It may answer and satisfy their own particular personal need and emphasis, but it is exactly the same experience, and it is always an experience of deliverance, of arriving, of being set free, of salvation. Look at that first group. Here they were in the wilderness, seeking for their city of habitation, but they couldn't find a city to dwell in. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. They've tried the other guides. They tried the philosophies. They did what all the people in the Old Testament had done, and the Greeks and the Romans and others. They'd all been seeking, but they couldn't find. At last one appears in the wilderness of life, and he says, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He is the only one who can lead us to the truth. The truth about God. The truth about ourselves. The truth about the state and the condition of our world tonight. The truth about the only way of deliverance and of salvation. He listened to me, he says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He knows. He can answer your every question. I don't care what it is. Here is the Lord of history. Here is the one who can illumine the past, show you the future. Here is the one who gives you complete intellectual satisfaction. You will arrive at the city of habitation, the city of truth. You remember how the author of the epistle to the Hebrews puts this in his great statement about Abraham and everybody like him. These men, he says, were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What were they doing? They were looking for a city. What sort of a city were they looking for? Oh, they were not looking for a city in this world. They were not just out to have a good time in this life and this world. They were not looking for cities that men can build. They know that they don't last. These men were looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker whose architect and artificer is God, the city of God. And they're brought there by him. He brought them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Complete intellectual satisfaction. But thank God he doesn't stop at that. Look at these second people with their terrible moral need, the slavery of sin, the uselessness of human effort and resolution. And in their utter helplessness, he cries out unto them, and he hears them, and he delivers them out of their distresses, all the things that have fettered them and enslaved them and got them down and made their life a ruination. My dear friends, Christian people, don't spend all your time in condemning these unfortunate young people here in Toronto and in other cities of the world tonight. They appear to be hopeless, don't they? Yes, from the standpoint of government and law and order and education and sociology, they are hopeless. But they're not hopeless. There is one who can deliver them. There is none hopeless. Listen to the way in which the apostle puts it about the Corinthians. Know ye not, he says, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified but he are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. That's what he says. 
He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Am I speaking to some husband or some wife that is in agony about a loved one who is in this condition of bondage? Am I speaking to parents who are at their wits' ends about their dear children who have gone astray and you've tried everything and you're feeling hopeless? Hold on, I say. Cry out unto this blessed Lord. With him nothing shall be impossible. He sets the prisoner free. And in exactly the same way with this third group, these people who've lost all interest in life, they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Here is one who promises to give us life and life more abundantly. Has your life become empty? Do you look forward to nothing but the drudgery of another Monday morning tomorrow and having to go through it all? Perhaps you're a housewife, perhaps you're going to an office. You said, life's empty, there's no romance in it, there's nothing in it. I'm just carrying on by sheer grim determination. My dear friend, there is life which is life indeed. He'll give you life and give it you more abundantly. He'll open out a vista to you that you can't even believe is possible. He'll put the life of God into your soul, and you'll begin to live in reality for the first time. Cry out unto him, and he'll give you something of his own blessed and glorious life. And in exactly the same way with the last group. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. These people have lost their grip on life, and who are the mere victims of circumstance and chance. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. What a gospel. I don't care what your need is. I don't care what particular form it takes. It doesn't matter. I don't care what your temperament is, what your psychology is. You're in need. You're in desperate need. And there is only one who can deliver you. He can. I don't care what your need is. He'll supply it, whether it's mainly intellectual, mainly moral, whether it's merely this general grip on life, or whether it's that you're a victim of... Sir. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, go to him. Cry out unto him. Cast yourself upon him and his amazing love. And he will satisfy your every need. He's died for your sins. He's borne your punishment. He's taken away your guilt. He's reconciled you to God. He'll give you a new life. He'll be with you. He'll put his spirit in you. He'll lead you all the way. God, you guide you, protect you, and at the end present you gloriously in the presence of his Father with exceeding joy. Shall we then take leave? Of our psalmist. I like to look at this picture. He's gathered his great choir together. He sent out his messengers, calling upon these people from the east and from the west, north and from the south, wherever you are, he says, come together. And he's assembled his great choir. And here I see him, standing before them, ready to conduct the great anthem. There are the soprano, there are the altar, there are the tenors, here are the bass. Are you all ready, he says. Very well, he raises his hands and he begins to conduct them. Now then, he says, you soprano, come along. And I hear them singing gloriously. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Come along, also, he says. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bends in sunder. He hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Come along, Tanner. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now then, base. He maketh the storm calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Full chorus, all together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. My dear friend, 
I have a final question to put to you. After these privileged and happy days that I've spent amongst you, I care not where you come from. Conceivably, there are people here on their holidays from distant parts. It doesn't matter. Thank God for such a gospel. I don't need to know you. I don't need to know your nationality. I don't need to know your upbringing. I need to know nothing because I know this about you. You're all sinners. We are all born sinners, born and shaped in sin and in iniquity. We're all helpless and helpless. I have but one question to ask you. Do you belong to this choir? Are you one who is singing this great and glorious anthem? Tell me, do you realize your position? Life is short and is fleeting. I am just a little agent calling people to join this great choir. There's a great conductor. I'm but a little agent. And I'm here to tell you that there are vacancies in the choir. It's a wonderful choir. I read of it in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. And I read here of four and twenty elders falling down before the Lamb, every, every, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us into our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. But listen, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, Here's the power, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying, singing with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in him and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, forever and ever. Do you belong to that choir? Don't you think you'd, begin, you'd better begin to come into training? Don't you think you'd better join the great rehearsal here on earth? Time is fleeting and is passing. It is my privilege to tell you that the day of grace has not, end has not ended. I care not what your antecedents have been. I care not what you were until you entered this sanctuary this evening. If you've seen your need, if you've seen your helplessness, cry out unto the Lord. He'll deliver you. And then you've got the qualification of joining the choir you'll even want to. You'll rush into it. And that will be your theme. Oh, that men should praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us unto God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you belong to the choir? Are you attending the rehearsals regularly? Are you attending your church regularly? Are you attending the prayer meeting of your church regularly? Are you offering your praise and your thanksgiving to him? Are you studying the notes? Are you perfect in your rendering, in your part? Oh, my dear friends, give you the whole of your time because that great day is coming and we shall be in that heavenly choir and shall sing forever and forever the praises of the Lamb that once was slain and hath redeemed us. Make certain that you belong to the choir. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. 
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.